Okay, let us start first with homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato Sadma Sambuddha Sadma Okay, we've been studying Sutta number 77 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is the Maha Sakko Udhai Sutta, the longer discourse to Sakko Udhai. And so sort of the theme of this Sutta is the reason why the Buddha's disciples respect and revere him. And in the portion that we took last week, we saw the Buddha ask the wanderer Sakodai why he thinks the Buddha's disciples respect him. And Sakodai mentions, I think it was five types of what moderate ascetic practice that he thought the Buddha excelled in. And then the Buddha said that if that were the case, then his disciples should respect and revere not himself, but certain of his other disciples who actually excelled him in these observances, like eating little, um, taking food only gathered on alms round, wearing rag, rag robes, and so on. And then the Buddha begins by explaining the real reasons why his disciples respect and revere him. And so that portion starts on 635, and we covered the first four of these, that is, because the Buddha observes the higher virtue, virtuous conduct, because the Buddha has what is called here excellent knowledge and vision, then the Buddha has the higher wisdom, and then the Buddha teaches the Four Noble Truths. Okay, now we come to the fifth section of the Sutta, in which the Buddha explains, well, this is the fifth reason why his disciples respect him, and all of these different groups that are going to be mentioned here come together under the general heading these headings were given probably, I think, by Venable Nyanamoli, or maybe I had yeah. them. And these are called the way to develop wholesome states or wholesome qualities. And so the rest of the sutta that comes under this heading constitutes, we could kind of call it a compendium of all the different practices taught by the Buddha, or most of the practices along the path to liberation. And the first seven sections here fit into a familiar framework which in the later tradition comes to be called the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. We come across the expression Bodhipakya Dhammas in the suttas themselves, but I think not with specific reference to these 37 states the term bodhipakya dhammas. Dhamma here would be you say, qualities or factors. Pakya is based upon the word which means side or wing. 
So it's factors that are on the side or the wing of Bodhi, which means enlightenment. Sometimes they're translated as wings to enlightenment or wings to awakening. It sounds good, but it's not quite accurate because Takiya doesn't mean the wings themselves, but it means things on the side of or on the wing of. So <laughs> it's a little bit like in politics, they have what they call the left wing and the right wing. So we don't call them <laughs> wings to government or wings to governance, but it's the right wing or the left wing. And so we have like I think there's another expression of kusala takiya dhamma. Which would mean factors on the side of the unwholesome. It doesn't mean <laughs> the wings to the unwholesome. <laughs> Okay, and so we have, under the general heading of these 37 factors that lead to enlightenment, or I, I call them the 37 aids to enlightenment, these factors fall into seven groups. We see them here, the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right kinds of striving, or the four right efforts, the four bases for spiritual power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven enlightenment factors, and the Noble Eightfold Path. And sometimes the issue is raised, or the question is raised, do these seven groups form a sequence, you know, a kind of meaningful sequence whereby one leads to another? And I think in certain schools of interpretation, they're taken in that way. As though one progresses from the four foundations of mindfulness to the four right efforts, then to the four bases for spiritual power, and so on. I remember years ago reading, it was a treatise by like a Tibetan scholar who explained that the bodhisattva, an aspirant for enlightenment, like for one aeon, he has to practice the four foundations of mindfulness, then the next aeon, you know, and the aeon is the time it takes for a world system to evolve and disintegrate. You know, something like, in modern astrophysical terms, maybe 35 billion years. <laughs> you know, so for 35 billion years you practice the four foundations of mindfulness. Then the next 35 billion years you practice the four right efforts. Then you go on to the four bases for spiritual power. And finally, after so many aeons, you come to the Noble Eightfold Path. <laughs> but in the mainstream Buddhism, at least within the Theravada tradition, they're not understood to form a, a sequence of development. In fact, even if you look at the, four, at the seven groups themselves, you could say something which will reveal what is the why they are arranged in this particular sequence. And what is that reason? Take a look at the groups and it should be clear to you. Or it might be clear to you. Any ideas? Tracy? Exactly, yeah. It's a kind of numerical progression. And this is the way, well, the Buddha often taught them this way. And the compilers of the texts often arrange texts in this way. So, you know, <laughs> the Anguttara Nikaya, hint, hint, <laughs> is arranged according to the Book of Ones, then the Twos, Threes, Fours, Fives, and so on, up to the Elevens. Then, a work called the Teragata, which collects the poems or verses of the ancient monks and nuns, arranges them first poems that have only one verse, then the next chapter poems that have two verses, 
and so on, up to poems that have, I think, 50 or 60 verses. So the governing pattern here is simply a numerical sequence. And as we'll see, there's a lot of intersections, interconnections, interweaving between these 37 factors. Okay, and so the first set that we have is the four foundations of mindfulness, or also called the four establishings of mindfulness. Okay, so here the Buddha says, he's continuing, he says, here, or again, Udayi, I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four foundations of mindfulness. And then these are expounded in terms of a standard formula that comes down again and again in the text. Here, a bhikkhu or a monk abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating feelings as feelings, he abides contemplating mind as mind, he abides contemplating, I don't quite agree with this translation now, I would say he abides contemplating phenomena as phenomena, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. And thereby many disciples of mine abide, having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. So you can see here that simply if one takes the four establishments of mindful, the four foundations of mindfulness as one's vehicle of practice, then that by itself can be considered a sufficient way to the achievement of ultimate realization. But of course, within the four foundations of mindfulness, we have all the other factors of the 37 aids to enlightenment are implied, and they can all evolve out of the four foundations of mindfulness. Okay, the four foundations of mindfulness are analyzed and explained in detail in the Majjhima Nikaya and Sutta number 10, that is the famous Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on the foundations of mindfulness. So I'm not going to explain it in detail here, but just to see what is involved in the four foundations of mindfulness. First, the four foundations of mindfulness are distinguished by way of the four objects. So we have the four objects of mindfulness to be the body, feelings, then mind in the sense of the general state of mind, and then we have a very broad category, which in Pali is simply called Dhammas. The word Dhamma is a word with almost an untranslatable meaning and with several nuances. Here it means, the way I understand it, to mean things in general, but organized in a particular way, which I'll come to. Okay, do we see any particular meaning or significance in the sequence in which these four foundations are laid out, laid out. Do you see any, any meaning in this sequence? Oh, please, yeah. Um, from, from the gross, like, body, yeah. or, you know, concrete to the more subtle. Exactly, exactly. Very, very well expressed. Yeah, it's from the grossest and, the, say, the easiest to discern, which is the body, then passing successively to subtler levels. And how did you put it again? You put... More subtle. Yeah. But there was a phrase you used that I thought was good. Okay, anyway, from the easiest to discern to the more difficult to discern. Okay, so one starts with awareness of the body, and this would comprise, could be a, an exercise like mindfulness of breathing, or the elements of the body, the four elements, 
or the constituent parts of the body, the 32, 31 parts, the awareness of the postures. This is where the walking meditation comes in. So one is when walking, one is aware of walking, when standing, aware of standing, when sitting, when lying down, one is aware of each posture. And then it also includes the famous or infamous channel ground meditations, meditating on the successive stages of the decomposition of a dead body. Okay, so as one is contemplating the body, then as the mind becomes more agile, more perceptive, more uh, refined, then one can pick up more easily on the different feelings that arise in the course of practice. So I can discern the pleasant, painful, neutral feelings. Then often, as one's awareness of the feelings becomes more precise, sharper, then one can see how particular states of mind arise in response to these feelings. So in response to pleasant feelings, there will arise states of mind which are governed by or driven by greed or attachment, attachment to the pleasant feelings. And then as one experiences painful feelings, there will arise states of mind governed by aversion towards the painful feelings. And then towards the, so often towards the neutral feelings, there will occur just a kind of dullness and sometimes a, a dullness, a lack of clear awareness. So this would be the state of mind which is cloaked by delusion. And then as one trains in observing these states of mind, one is able to dispel the defilements that are governing them. And so then one will see how the mind is freed from, at least temporarily, from attachment, from aversion, from delusion. And then as the practice progresses, then one can observe the, or note the subtler states of mind that arise through the progression, through the series. Okay, the fourth foundation of mindfulness is in Pali is called Dhammas. And so the word Dhamma is used in the plural to refer most broadly to all phenomena in general. But if we look at the contemplation of Dhammas, we see, as it's explained in the Satipatthana Sutta, we see that these phenomena are actually organized into particular subordinate groups. And so these groups are the, uh, the five hindrances, the five aggregates, the six internal and external sense spaces, and then the defilements that arise based on those, or the fetters that arise based on those sensory experiences. Then the seven factors of enlightenment, and then the four noble truths culminating in the direct experience of the four noble truths. So the way I understand the fourth foundation of mindfulness here, what it means are phenomena organized according to the, we call them the dominant categories of the Dhamma. Dhamma as the Buddha's teaching. So we have the five hindrances because those are the primary obstacles to mental development. Then we have two groups of phenomena that are to be contemplated in order to understand the nature of things. That is the five aggregates and the six sense bases. Those gives, give us two alternative ways to get insight into our direct experience. Then as what is exploring either the five aggregates or the six sense bases, then the mind starts to progress 
in the sequence of insight knowledges. And so now one enters into the seven factors of enlightenment. So now these factors are moving very in a very direct way towards the culminating experience, the breakthrough experience of realization. And when that breakthrough experience of realization takes place, it brings the direct cognition of the Four Noble Truths, <clears throat> which is the core, you could say that's the core Dhamma at the heart of the Buddha Dhamma. <clears throat> and then the realization of the Four Noble Truths culminates in the direct perception of Nibbana, the ultimate unconditioned Dhamma. Okay, so this is the way the contemplation of, the way I interpret the um, contemplation of Dhammas. So it's the contemplation of phenomena organized in terms of the primary categories of the Dhamma as the Buddha's teaching, culminating in a realization of the core principle or teaching at the heart of the Dhamma, that is the Four Noble Truths. And then let's see what's involved in this process of being mindful. You know, nowadays it's become very popular to speak about mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness. So we have mindful cooking, mindfully washing the dishes, mindfully bringing up babies, mindfully mindful education, mindful, mindfulness and stress reduction, mindfulness and psychotherapy, mindfulness in mindful, mindful politics. <laughs> so it seems like mindfulness has been a bit singled out for special, uh, you know, Academy Awards, you know, the Oscar goes to mindfulness. <laughs> and best picture of best mental factor of the year. <laughs> mindfulness come up. Everybody cheering. Yay, yay, yay. But look at the way the text explains what is meant by the four foundations of mindfulness. One's wells, okay, contemplating the body as a body. We have the word here, contemplating, it's anupassi, anupassana, which means, anupassana means closely seeing. Literally, it's closely seeing or closely observing, repeatedly observing. Okay, so he advised, that's, that's Anupasi here is translated contemplating, but literally it's closely observing or repeatedly observing. Then we have the word ardent. We have the word ardent, of course it's used <laughs> in matters of love. Oh, he was so ardent. But here, the word ardent Oh, wow, this is the wrong kind of... Okay, it doesn't matter. We just have to do it orally. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Okay, the word ardent in Pali, it's atapi, which is closely connected with energy. 
In fact, the commentaries explain that is, what is meant by atapi is the factor of energy. So we have energy present, effort. So when is practicing mindfulness diligently, with effort, with energy, then the word translated as fully aware, I don't quite like this now. I mean, this was Venerable Yanamoli's choice, because the word aware has been used to render so many Pali words that it loses any kind of very precise meaning. But rather, I prefer to render it as clearly comprehending. And clearly comprehending sort of suggests that there's a factor of wisdom involved here. It's not yet the higher wisdom of direct insight, but already there's a capacity for discerning, distinguishing, understanding, comprehending. Okay, and mindful, so one is clearly comprehending and mindful. So you see, when mindfulness gets that Academy Award, he comes out on the stage and says, thank you so much, I deeply appreciate it, but I couldn't have done it without my director, um, closely observant, close observance, please come out and take a hand. So close observance comes up to the stage, that was my director and the producer is right effort that we're calling otter or being ardent. Come up, I want to share this award with right effort. And then of course the one who made it all possible, the producer. Did I say the producer is right effort? Okay, mindfulness is the best, is the... Well, I wouldn't say that clear comprehension is just... The su okay, we'll say that my supporting actor yeah, or actress, a clear comprehension. Okay, and then we have putting away what's called covetousness and grief for the world. So this shows the direction that mindfulness should be taking within the four foundations of mindfulness. Here, covetousness, it's a rather awkward word, but the Pali word abhijja suggests clinging or craving. And then grief, here, dominasa is more like dejection. It doesn't have to be, or sadness. It, grief usually suggests an extreme sadness to the point that one is overwhelmed. But rather we could say covetousness represents the clinging or craving for things in the world, and dejection are feelings of despondency, any kind of sadness, discouragement in regard to worldly matters. Okay, so all of these factors come together working as a team. Oh, and then putting away covetousness and grief seems to point to the development, though it's not stated explicitly, but the development of concentration or samadhi. So we have these factors all working together here. Mindfulness with energy, with clear comprehension, which is the seed of wisdom. And we have incipient, or the initial stage of samadhi, a concentration in this removing attachment and dejection. So these are all working together in the contemplation or close observation of these four bases of mindfulness.
Okay, does anybody have any question on this part so far? I take, I take the microphone. Okay. Was there a poly word for um, clearly comprehending? I think it sounded to me like you were going to tell us that and you said it was oh. a factor of wisdom, yeah. not the... Um, yeah. The, there, yeah, the poly word is sampajano. Sampajano describes the person, the person who's clearly comprehending. Yeah, this is a quote and so on. No, this is a very different word. Yeah, that is, it's jhana has the jh, which is a completely different letter. But the word sampajano, this is one who's clearly comprehending, and then clear comprehension, the abstract noun is sampajanya. This is based on the verb that Janati, which means to know. And so it has two prefixes, sam, which often gives a sense of fullness, and pa, sometimes gives a sense maybe of activity. And so we have another word very similar to this. It's based on the same verb. This is the word panya, which is what we translate Often is wisdom. Or insight. And the verb here maybe shows up more clearly in the verb, pajanati. It's the verb is the same janati, janati, which goes into sampajano. And it has the prefix pa, as in panya, which we see the prefix here. So you can see that there is a verbal connection between sampa, janya, and panya. But sampa janya usually indicates, say, clear comprehension and whatever activity one is engaged in, knowing what one is doing and knowing what is occurring within one, what kind of experience one is undergoing. <clears throat> so that when one is feeling any kind of, experiencing any kind of feeling, one is clearly comprehending what that feeling is. When any state of mind has arisen, one clearly comprehends what state of mind has arisen. Whereas panya, as wisdom, usually signifies more precisely having insight into the three characteristics, sometimes into the specific characteristics, say of the five aggregates, and then the general characteristics of impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. But sampajanya is what gives birth to panya, to wisdom. Any further questions here? Okay, just on this portion. Okay, then we'll go on to the second um, group.
Okay, so here we have four. There are four factors here, the first four of the 37. Now we come to the next, which is also a group of four. These are called the four samapadana. I'm just wondering if there could be rubbing alcohol. There's a medical, a first aid kit here with rubbing alcohol. That might be. That's a rather difficult process, you know. of striving. The word striving is samapadana, which is equivalent pretty much to samavayama, which is right effort. So we have here four kinds of right effort, which are, okay, they're explained here again, this is a fixed formula. Here, a monk awakens zeal. I don't like that word, it's more desire. The word is chanda. He awakens desire for the non-arising of of unarisen. I don't like evil, I think bad is better. Bad, unwholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. He awakens zeal for the abandoning of arisen evil, unwholesome states. He awakens zeal for the arising of unarisen, wholesome states. He awakens zeal for the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states, and he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. So these are actually all terms, just alternative terms, for expressing the idea of effort or energy. But this energy or effort is applied in the task of training the mind, And you can see how systematically the Buddha lays things out. First, he divides the qualities of the mind into the two broad categories of the unwholesome and the wholesome. Then each of these he divides into those that have not arisen and those that have already arisen. So in regard to First try just okay. With regard to the unwholesome states, first the energy is used to prevent the arising of states that have not yet arisen. 
And some texts explain that this is done specifically through what's called restraint of the senses. Since if one exercises restraint over the senses, then states of attachment and aversion towards respectively the agreeable and disagreeable objects of experience won't arise. Okay, then, with regard to those unwholesome states of mind that have already arisen, one applies energy to remove them, to eliminate them. So this is the energy that's used to dispel and remove unwholesome thoughts, unwholesome emotions, particularly the states of, could be the five hindrances, or greed, hatred, and delusion. Okay, then one applies the energy with regard to the wholesome states. Again, we have those that have not yet arisen, and so one has to apply the energy to bring them into being, to arouse them. And this is explained elsewhere as arousing or bringing into being the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the five, four bases of spiritual power, and so on. So it's the effort to develop all 37 aids to enlightenment. And then, once those wholesome qualities have arisen, then one applies effort to maintain them and to make them grow stronger, to reach fulfillment. Okay, so this is the four right kinds of striving, which are the four right efforts. Now we come to, this is a group which I always found a little bit puzzling. It's called the Four Bases for Spiritual Power. In Pali, these are called the Itipada. And now the word Iti, which is what's translated spiritual power, is used elsewhere in the text to refer to the special supernormal powers that a meditator can develop you know, through deep samadhi or concentration. We'll actually come across them, I think, later in this, in this sutta itself. If you just jump ahead to page 643, Paragraph 31, we have here, I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to wield the various kinds of supernormal power, that is, having been one, they become many, having been many, they become one, they appear, and then they vanish, you know, vanishing into thin air. They can pass through walls without being obstructed. They can um, dive in and out of the earth as though it were water. They can walk on water without sinking, and so on. So it would seem to me a little bit peculiar that the Buddha includes methods for developing these kinds of spiritual power in the midst of a group of factors which otherwise are directed towards the attainment of, simply attainment of enlightenment. And so I'm not, you know, I don't have a very clear idea of why this group is included here. But we can see that within this group we have emphasis on four factors which occur elsewhere in the path as factors that will lead to concentration, insight, and awakening. So we have here, first a monk develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to zeal, or better, I would say, due to desire and determined striving. He develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to energy and determined striving. 
He develops the basis for spiritual power and concentration due to, the text just says, mind and determined striving. And he develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to investigation and determined striving. And thereby many disciples of mine abide having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. Okay, so we see that there are these four bases for spiritual power and they have certain factors in common, factors that are common to all of them. What are those factors? As expressed in the formula. The common factors. Yeah. And Yeah, it speaks. Yeah. Two factors that are common concentration and determined striving. Okay, now determined striving. There are some suttas in Samyutta Nikaya. There's a whole chapter in the Samyutta Nikaya and the four bases for spiritual power. And those suttas explain determined striving simply by way of the formula for the four right kinds of striving. So we see the four bases for spiritual power include within them the four kinds of right striving. And then we have common to the four kinds of bases for spiritual power concentration, which is samadhi. And samadhi, we'll say, is a factor, an aid to enlightenment, which occurs in several of these groups. But what distinguishes the four bases is the factor by means of which the practitioner gains that concentration. And so the four factors are mentioned here. One is desire. The Pali word is chanda. Sometimes the word chanda, desire, is used in a negative or unwholesome sense, where it's equivalent to craving or greed. But elsewhere, chanda is used in a positive or affirmative sense, as desire for the development of wholesome qualities, desire for the goal, and so on. So, you know, when people say that, some people say, oh, Buddhism tells us to eliminate desire, that means that we have to eliminate desire for the good as well as the bad, and so it just reduces us to being like a vegetable. That was my mother's argument against Buddhism. <laughs> You say that to get rid of suffering, you have to eliminate desire. When you get rid of desire, you don't have any desire to do what is good, as well as what is bad. Therefore, quote a rap demonstratum, <laughs> you become like a vegetable, which doesn't have any desire. But actually, the Buddha says to eliminate the unwholesome type of desire, but he encourages the desire for good qualities. In this case, it's the desire for concentration, which doesn't mean that you're always sitting there just thinking, i got to get concentration, i got to get samadhi, everybody else has gotten it, I'm the only one who hasn't gotten it, or they've gotten one level of concentration, I have to surpass them, so I will be number one. It's not that kind of desire. But one knows that samadhi is the basis for the development of insight or wisdom. And so, with that desire guiding the practice, then one uses determined striving in order to strive diligently, and thereby, eventually, one achieves samadhi or concentration. Okay, the next one uses energy or effort seems that there's a subtle difference between 
desire and energy. Could anybody characterize that difference? Anybody have any way to characterize the difference between desire and energy? Um, Katie? It, please take the microphone from the person who has it. And speak loudly. Oh, I, I see you. No, it was Katie here. She. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. I don't have the answer. There's a sensation just after there's desire. A person can harvest just the sensation without the characterization. Like there's a, an energetic quality. Mm -hmm. um, same as happiness. A person can detect mm -hmm. the sensation underlying happiness. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any ideas? Um, I think of uh, the desire as being kind of a mental thing and the energy and effort being a bodily thing. Being a bodily thing? Yeah. I wouldn't say that effort is a bodily thing because effort, as explained here, is you know, the effort to prevent the arising of unarisen. They're both mental. Anybody else have any? And I don't have a fixed, you know, I'm not sort of testing you to see whether you hit the nail on the head. I'm just trying to get people's um, understanding of the difference. Tracy, uh, or I think um, Sandy, had her, you, did you have your hand up? Sandy? I think desire is more like an intention. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, uh, anger is like an action. Okay, that's a good way to put it. The desire involves, like the, let's say, the intentional factor is more prominent. And how did you express the effort? The effort is like uh, put the intention into action. Okay, putting the yeah, put, uh, putting the intention into action. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And then Tracy, you can take this microphone or speak very loudly. I think of uh, desire as will and energy as willingness, availability, or potential. So desire is an intention or a will, yeah. and energy is a willingness, the capacity or potential to fulfill the desire. Yeah, though maybe the word energy in English suggests something like potential energy. Whereas here, this is applied energy or effort. Yeah. But you, what you said about <coughs> desire being an, a will, the will, but that that's, corresponds closely to the idea of the intention. Yeah. And then, I guess, effort, you could say, is put, using determination to accomplish the aim. Well, for me, willingness and availability is a definite state. Because yeah, yeah. I can have an idol like desire, but if I don't have energy... I oh, yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah. That's somebody, that's something from the internet? Yes. Okay, let us see. Okay, could the four bases for spiritual power be successful attainment of the four jhanas and then further development of the spirit of the supernormal powers? Yeah, well, of course, the four bases for spiritual power are said to be the means for developing concentration. And then on that basis of that concentration, one can develop the supernormal powers. But in the work like the Visuddhi Mata, the Four bases for spiritual power are mentioned as the special practices that one has to develop after developing the jhanas in order to direct the mental power of the jhanas towards developing these supernormal powers. But what puzzles me 
is amongst these 37 aids to enlightenment, one doesn't see anything else sort of leaning towards the supernormal powers, but it all seems like a pretty straight, straight recipe or set of instructions for insight and wisdom. But here it seems a little bit going off on the tangent. Okay, let's try to go through the rest of them. Okay, the third one is the basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to, it was Jnana Moli who added purity of, but the text just has chitta, mind. So concentration due to mind and determined striving. Again, this is a little unclear to me. You know, where does mind as such differ from desire, which is sort of the intentional application of mind, and energy, which is, or effort, which is, again, this mental application. The way I would understand it, and this is just by purely personal interpretation, that instead of sort of fixing the mind in the determined direction, the way one does with effort and with, in, with desire, when the mind, through the development of meditation, becomes sort of bright and luminous and at ease or relaxed, softened, one sinks into that luminosity and softness of the mind and lets that luminosity and softness and um, tranquilization of the mind unfold by itself without having to fix the mind and empower the mind in a particular way. But just one lets, it's a kind of letting go of effort after one reaches a certain point, and as one lets go of effort, the mind sort of spontaneously, through the empowerment what is already given it, expands and develops and unfolds into the state of samadhi. Does anybody else have any thoughts about that? Apparently, then Lunyana Moli did, well, he, by adding the, in brackets, the expression purity of mind, which actually seems close to what I said, as the mind becomes purified, you say, one just you know, keeps all the impure factors or defiling factors away and just lets that purity become stronger and more potent on its own. Okay, then the fourth basis for spiritual power is concentration due to, wow, this is, this is a basis for spiritual power consisting in desire, energy. <laughs> Heidi, you've just been applauded for... <laughs> You have to now just turn around and display your supernormal powers. <laughs> Is that Kylie up on the ceiling, lying around again? Okay, so the fourth is the concentration due to investigation. And the, the word that's used here is vimangsa. So this is usually used in relation to the development of wisdom. So it seems that this would be a kind of concentration that, that, though it's not said explicitly, but this is the way I would interpret, the concentration that develops through the practice of insight meditation. As one is investigating and examining things, then the mind becomes increasingly concentrated. And then if one wants to use that concentration instead of strengthening insight further, one could let the investigation of insight sort of set, one could put it aside and just let the concentration on its own deepen. So one uses investigation or insight to develop concentration and then one 
puts the insight aside and strengthens the concentration until it will bring you know, deeper states of samadhi. Okay, so these are the four bases for spiritual power. Any questions about this, please? Okay, now we move into the five faculties, the five spiritual faculties. I'm a little afraid to write on this board <laughs> because it seems that the, these types of ink will stick to the board. I don't want anybody to go through work. But these are called in Pali the five indriyas. I-N-D-R-I-Y-A. And the word indriya is derived from the name of one of the Vedic deities, Indra, who is considered in some of the Vedas the ruler of the gods. So just as Indra exercises rulership over the other deities, so these five faculties, each in their own way, access exercise rulership or domination in a particular way of cultivating the mind. So we have five spiritual faculties here with they're set out in this formula that the monk develops the faculty of faith which leads to peace, leads to enlightenment. He develops the faculty of energy, the faculty of mindfulness, the faculty of concentration, the faculty of wisdom, which leads to peace, leads to enlightenment. And thereby many disciples reach the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. Okay, here I would say that I see a definite pattern of development. Okay, when it begins with faith, or in the Pali word sada, which doesn't mean like blindly believing certain doctrines, but it means that one begins with a kind of trust in the basic, the, say, basic principles of the Buddha's teaching and with the course of training or practice. So the basic principles or framework would be like the Four Noble Truths, the Three Marks of Existence, and the basic practice would be the development of virtuous conduct, concentration, wisdom, and so on. Okay, so with that faith, or trust, one enters the practice, and then the practice consists primarily, in the initial stages, in the interplay of energy and mindfulness. We could say that one applies effort in cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness. So you can see here we have with the faculty of energy, which is explained elsewhere as the four kinds of right striving, and the faculty of mindfulness is explained as the four foundations of mindfulness. So on uses energy or effort to cultivate the four foundations of mindfulness. So these are like two hands which are washing one another, effort and mindfulness. Then as one develops energy and mindfulness together, out of that interplay there emerges the mind becomes settled, focused, tranquil, so, concentration or samadhi emerges. So this is the faculty of concentration. And then, when concentration is sufficiently developed, one brings together the faculties of energy, mindfulness, and concentration in order to develop insight. And so it's now mindfulness is applied in a different way, not just to develop concentration, but in order to discern the nature of things more precisely. 
And so that will bring insight and what exercises insight is the faculty of wisdom. Sometimes in the commentaries it's said that the five faculties can be divided, we, well, let's say we take the five faculties and we see that there are two pairs amongst these five which have to be balanced. One is faith and wisdom, that one has to balance faith and wisdom. Since if one has faith without wisdom, then one would be inclined just to blind belief, but just to simple credulity. Or well, one could incline towards a kind of dogmatism. Oh, one accepts the teaching out of faith, and then one argues, oh, the Buddha's three characteristics, those are the greatest, the most wonderful, that's the thought dependent origination, that can knock away all the other teachings. I mean, I've seen Buddhists like this who always are proudly extolling the, the principles of the Buddha's teaching, but they never get around to seriously practicing it. So that's due to an excess of faith. Then if one has excess of wisdom but not enough faith, one could use the teaching as a kind of intellectual toy, you know, for playing games of refutation, argumentation, working out, finding different ways to systematize the teaching. But because one lacks, deep within, one lacks sufficient faith, again, one doesn't take up the actual practice. So too much faith without wisdom leads to dogmatism and blind credulity. And too much wisdom well, it's not real wisdom, but let's say intellectual understanding without faith can lead to intellectual cleverness without experience, through pra without realization, through practice. But when faith and wisdom, faith and intelligence are balanced, then one could practice in a way that will bring true wisdom. Okay, then the other two faculties that have to be put into balance, held in balance, are energy and concentration. If there is an excess of energy without enough calmness in the mind, then the mind becomes restless and agitated. And this will lead to which of the five hindrances? Restlessness. Yeah, restlessness and remorse. So this is energy which is not properly applied when just sometimes one is too eager to obtain things in practice and so one tries very, very diligently but without applying that energy properly, without One applies energy in what I would call a hard or driving mode, not using sufficient softness and gentleness in the application of energy. And then if there's too much, they say, too much concentration or stillness without enough energy, then what happens? Speak up. Yeah, there can be dullness, the mind becomes dull and drowsy. This isn't really samadhi, but it's a kind of sometimes a false samadhi. Somebody gets really drowsy, 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 then they sometimes blank out for a moment, and then they think that they've reached um, <laughs> nirodha samapati, the attainment of cessation, or even that they've experienced uh, sotapati, stream entry. <laughs> So that's too much like stillness and softness of the mind without the drive of energy or effort. But when you keep energy and effort balanced, I'm saying, when you keep energy and 
concentration balance, then you get the true concentration. Okay, then what happens to mindfulness in this fivefold scheme? Nothing to balance out mindfulness. Yeah, I can't hear without... Where is that, the, the microphone? You, you. Okay, she said mindfulness supports the other faculties. Yeah, mindfulness is said to be that faculty which sort of regulates the interrelationship of the other faculties to ensure that there's a balance between them. Okay, now we move on to the five powers. So the five powers, we'll see, these are called Bala, B-A-L-A. The five powers correspond exactly to the five faculties. So I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the five powers. Here a monk develops the power of faith, which leads to enlightenment. The power of energy, power of mindfulness, power of concentration, power of wisdom, which leads to peace, leads to enlightenment. So the question comes up, what is the relationship, relationship between the faculties and the powers? And here there is some difference of opinion. Different interpreters have different opinions. Some say, I think this is the commentarial position, based on the Abhidharma, that the faculties and powers are really the same states, just viewed from a different perspective. The five faculties are these five qualities viewed from the perspective of exercising rulership in their own departments, so to speak, in the unfolding of the path to enlightenment. So maybe these, you could say, are like five cabinet members or five ministers of state. We have the minister of defense, minister of sec uh, secretary of defense, secretary of, secretary of state, secretary of the treasury, secretary of, is there commerce, department of commerce, secretary of, what is another one? It's Excuse me? Secretary of Labor, okay. So they're at a conference, each has their own, you know, specific sphere of authority, but they have to pool their insights, their skills, their capacities, their experience together in order to see that the country is governed successfully, so it becomes a prosperous, peaceful, um, equitable country. The five powers are basically the five, same five ministers, but it's said that the power has the sense that it's something that cannot be shaken by its opposite. So, Faith cannot be shaken by skepticism or doubt. Energy cannot be shaken by laziness or by, you know, by laziness. Mindfulness cannot be shaken by forgetfulness or this mental um, mud muddle-mindedness. Concentration cannot be shaken by distracting thoughts. And wisdom cannot be shaken by stupidity or ignorance.
So maybe this would be like the five ministers or five secretaries in the cabinet that cannot be shaken by troublemakers within the government or maybe by opponents from the opposite party. So the minister or secretary of state can't be shaken by, let us say, by members of Congress who have some interest in affairs of state. The Minister of Defense, Secretary of Defense, cannot be shaken by the members of the House. We have a military committee, Armed Services Committee. The Secretary of Commerce cannot be shaken by you know, the co committee, corresponding committee from the House. Secretary of Labor can't be shaken by the House Committee on such and such affairs. Secretary of Education, again, can't be shaken by the House Committee on Education. But they are trying to make trouble because they belong to opposite parties. But when these secretaries or ministers are secure in their position, they can't be shaken by the opposite party. Okay, so some say that the five faculties, five powers are the same, just considered from different perspectives. Others say that the five faculties are these five qualities in the earlier stages of the practice, and then when they build up strength, then they become the five powers. I don't have a particular position between one interpretation or the other. Say, speak to No, no, I don't think they correspond to the hindrances. You can't say that the faculty of faith is supposed to, well, actually it, it does go against doubt. Faculty, That's what made me think that they faculty, it, because you said that. Oh, faculty of energy dullness, could go against energy. dullness and drowsiness. The faculty of concentration can go against restlessness and worry. That's the faculty of wisdom. Let's see, we have aversion and sensual desire. Yeah, I don't see where sensual desire and aversion will be opposed to the other two by the other two faculties. There would be a there's some correspondence there, but we can't say it's an exact correspondence. Okay, now we come to the seven enlightenment factors. These are the called bojangas. Here we have in, angas are factors that lead to bodhi. Bodhi is enlightenment. So when you have bodhi and anga together, that dhya sound turns into j, so bojanga. So here the Buddha teaches the seven enlightenment factors. Okay, here a monk develops the mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion. Maybe this takes a little more interpre interpretation and explanation. I think I should maybe take these sets next week. And for now I'll just ask whether we have any questions on anything that's been covered so far. Otherwise I have to rush through this rather superficially through the Enlightenment factors and the Noble Eightfold Path. Where, whereas they require some interpret some explanation. Okay. Okay. This is actually a comment. Anapanasati is said to be the one practice that naturally leads to the four foundations of mindfulness, and then it leads to the seven factors of enlightenment, and then this brings nirvana. So the other 37 factors are not given equal prominence. Okay, so, you know, 
there is a sutta where the Buddha speaks about how one who develops anapanasati through the 16 steps or 16 aspects is developing the four foundations of mindfulness then the four foundations of mindfulness, you know, they focus on mindfulness, which is the first of the seven factors of enlightenment. So in this way, he is developing the seven enlightenment factors, and then he reaches liberation. So that is one scheme, and that scheme doesn't mention the other 37 factors of, of enlightenment, or 37 A's to enlightenment, but it doesn't mean that they're not important or can be dismissed. It's just that the Buddha uses different expositions which give prominence to different factors. Like there is a sutta where the Buddha says, one who practices the four foundations of mindfulness as they have been taught here will reach one of two goals, either arhatship or the state of a non-returner. So here the Buddha is just expounding the four foundations of mindfulness. He doesn't mention the five faculties, the four right efforts, the four bases of spiritual power, the five powers. He does mention the seven enlightenment factors within the fourth foundation of mindfulness. But basically, he uses just the four foundations of mindfulness leading to the goal. Other places, the Buddha will use just the seven enlightenment factors as leading to the goal. Other places, just the five faculties as leading to the goal. So, different strokes for different folks, as they say. You know, the Buddha just varies the teaching according to the situation or the capacity of those that he's teaching. Okay, then, well, this I think is a continuation of the same question. Does it mean that they, I think the other 37 factors, are merely details of the primary practice? But there are other practices besides Anapanasati. One can't say that Anapanasati alone is the practice. There are some suttas which speak about developing the four Brahma-viharas and then developing the seven enlightenment factors on the basis of the Brahma-viharas. Okay, any, any further questions? Okay, if not, then we'll end for the, for the day here. Um, maybe we won't have the discussion period today but rather we'll take the discussion period next week when we complete the sutta. So if you have any further questions you know, on this section, write them down and bring them next week. Then when we are back in our familiar accommodation, the Guanyin Hall, then we can have the discussion period. Okay, so we'll end the, the class with the sharing of the merits. Okay, so we share the merits of the meditation session, the session of teaching and listening and discussing the Dhamma. We dedicate the merit to the Devas, the fear spirits, the protective spirits, and all sentient beings in the world. Akasata Chabumata Adeva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Nanumodipa Shiram Rakantu Sasanam Akasata Chabumata Adeva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Nanumodipa Shiram Rakantu Sasanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Medika Punyanta Nanumo Dipa Shiram Rakantu Mamparam Eta Vatacham Hei Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Deva Nomo Dantu Sabasampati Siddhya 
Thank you. 